So I kind of am wondering what it is I'm going to grow next year, um, particularly with the summer garden, because we've had such amazing success this year with the summer garden that it really is insane. I mean, people, I don't know if they necessarily can really comprehend because, you know, it's only photos, it's only video. Um, I can only show you so many angles of the of the summer garden. You know, the whole thing on the left side here, if you're looking at our Facebook or Instagram page, you guys can see this photo I I took of myself with the uh, with the summer garden. On the left side of the garden of the corn is the figs, and I have three rows of figs here. We have some flowers in there. There's some rosemary back there, um, and then there's a raised bed right here, and the, the raised bed really really blocks out the whole thing. So, yeah, you got about six or eight feet for the figs on the left and then it it's a really a 10 foot wide bed um and then it goes back um about 12 feet somewhere around 12 feet um it's really not that large um and it's amazing to me how much food we we I've been growing in this such such a small area. Um, it's so dense in there that I can't even film it. I didn't think this far ahead. Um, there's so much food there, so many plants that I, again I just literally can't get in there to show everybody all the different angles of the garden. Um, so I don't know how anyone really that's watching could really comprehend and understand this whole thing. Um, you just have to take my word for it. It's just been, it's been crazy. And I've always had a pretty darn good summer garden. I mean, some of the crops I've grown in the past were not a, a success, you know, um, like they are this year. This year I got everything right. Everything with the summer garden. I mean, literally everything. Um, the zucchini this year, the patty pan squash is the only thing that is basically just kind of running out of steam at this point. Because uh, there there were some borers that got into the into the squash. I had never even knew that that was a thing. I heard about it recently, and then I went outside. I was like thinking about this. Well, why is my zucchini not doing well? Then I heard about it just by chance and then went outside and saw that the uh, the borers have bored into my zucchini stems. So that's basically what happened um, with the zucchini. But other than that, I mean, it's just been insane. I've even I've even seen a lot of cucumber beetles around. Um, I've seen a lot of pests around, and it just doesn't matter. The garden is so incredible this year. It really doesn't matter. Um, I've gotten my fair share of zucchini, too. It's not like I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going to get any zucchini this year. You know, every single crop I grew hit the nail on the head. Corn is fantastic. I mean, look at my corn. Look at that. That's that that is in your corn right there. First off, the entire thing is pollinated to perfection. I could have waited a little bit longer for the the kernels to be a bit more plump. You know, uh, they say pick them pick the corn when it's a bit milky. You pop the uh, the kernels. It should be milky instead of clear in there. Um I so I could wait a little bit longer, but it's still so so good. It's just it's perfect. The corn was perfect. You know, the the melons are coming in um, surprisingly very well and easily. I think there's a little bit too much shading going on on some of them. But overall, there's a lot of melons in this area here underneath the corn. The Hidatsa shield beans are a bit further behind than what I would like because I didn't I didn't think the corn was going to grow that wet, that fast. So I guess I could have, without a doubt, I could have grown corn um, 
or I could have grown, I could have done a better job with the beans. The eggplants, the peppers, the tomatoes, the ground cherries, the basil, it's all insane. It's all absolutely insane. It's, it, it, you can't even see it behind this corn, but it's just a wall of all that stuff. And I've been harvesting like crazy. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I want to figure out what I'm going to grow next year because when you have such success like this, you kind of feel like, oh, man. I can do anything. I can grow anything. Um, you know, I have no real fear or, uh, you know, it's just like, well, what's next? You know, if you can do everything so well, uh, you got to like eventually to learn, you got to fail at something. So I got to try something new. I got to, I got to keep failing so I can keep learning. And, um, not that there's nothing to learn with these crops, but I feel like it's a joke this year. Uh, a lot of it is stemming from, I think, first off, just having a little bit more of a fertile soil than what I'm used to. The Just Natural uh, soil conditioner is a great soil, okay? But it's not very fertile. And I think having more fertility in my soil went a very, very long way. Whether that is, you know, actually feeding the soil or feeding the plants with some fertilizer uh, with a foliar spray. Also doing just a very few, but at, but very well-timed waterings, um, particularly with the corn, particularly very early in the season. You know, it has been very dry, but really I think getting all that but then really the bigger the bigger thing i think with all of this has been the timing of the planting the transplants getting all the transplants right uh although i didn't transplant almost any of this which is kind of crazy everything was direct seeded that that i mentioned the ground cherries the basil the tomatoes the eggplants the peppers the corn the only thing that wasn't direct seeded was the melons and the uh the patty pan squash so and i think honestly it'd be i would have even a better even more success maybe if i were to do some transplants you know it depends on how good you are transplanting these crops like you know what size these crops are um you know, maybe that's where I'm. Ha that's why maybe I'm having such good success is that every most of it was direct seeded. Um, you know, that's another factor I should consider in here, and maybe because you're not, I'm not transplanting certain things in. Um, I know there's a there's the right way to transplant. The smaller you transplant, usually the better. Uh, but you know, up to a point, obviously you don't want to be the you don't want to go too small with your transplants, but you know, it is nice to, I think, have the plants direct seeded in and they just seem to dig themselves in better. They seem to have better resistance. Um, definitely the melons and the zucchini, that's probably the best I've ever transplanted them. It seemed almost seamless. It was pretty much seamless. And I mean, that's what a tra that's what a transplant really should be. So if, you know, if I did that with all of them, I, sh I guess I should be technically just as fine as if I didn't um, do transplants, but better. I'd be a little bit earlier in the season with some of this stuff. I don't know, but I'll tell you this. There was one thing I did that I think made the biggest difference of them all. I mean, obviously, you got to get the timing right. You gotta get the fertility right in the soil. The soil has gotta be right. The timing of the waterings, you know, the timings of the plantings. Um, but the biggest thing I think I did was actually use a product called Dynagro Protect. And this Dynagro Protect, I've talked about it so many times at this point. It is a foliar spray from the company Dynagro. As you can see, it's really not all that expensive. Uh, it's like eight, nine or $10. 
Um, you could probably find it for free shipping. The bottle goes a pretty long way. Now, what's in it, though, is silica. So the silica in the in the product uh, just makes the plants so much stronger, I find. First off, they really just take off. Um, they adapt. They I think they adapt better to their environment. Obviously, it improves. I guess you could just say it improves the plant's immune system, right? It increases disease resistance, pest resistance, heat stress, drought stress, cold stress, um, any stress whatsoever. Um, you know, it also, it seems like because the plant is stronger, it then seems to grow better, right? It tra if it's less stressed out, it grows better, performs better. Uh, it's also got some of that potassium in it, which potassium obviously is a big help um, with the overall health of any plant. So the silica, I think, though, may gives it a, a huge boost in just how strong these plants are. Um and particularly with the pest resistance. So a big reason why you you don't direct seed with a lot of these crops is that you need to get your plant somewhat established before you plant it in the ground. Because if you do seedlings, the pests and things really like those smaller seedlings, like the flea beetles, there's the uh, potato beetle on the eggplants, the cucumber beetle. Different things just seem to really ravage these plants um, if they're if they're smaller, right? The the more tender plants tend to get attacked more often. The tender growth tends to be attacked more often, just because it's more tender and it's just more appealing to to insects and pests and different things, right? So. If you got yourself a more established plant, even if it does take some damage, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to kill it or it's not going to be the end of the world. So you just, it ends up working out and it really hedges your bets. But I'm telling you, if you spray these, these young plants, very young seedlings, in fact, I've been doing it on my, my fall garden. Um, to help them get through this really hot time and also to help them with pests because there there is pests right now big time for fall garden crops for these cooler season crops like brassicas and things um, if you just give them a spray um, with the silica at a young age a young size it's like nothing bothers them um, in fact I noticed this with a lot of my young plants in my summer garden that were really struggling to adapt, to do well, they were getting attacked in the, this is in the, you know, mid spring when I planted these, my summer garden, May 1st, May 15th, you know, this is the time when this kind of thing happens. And all I did was give them a number of different feedings uh, with the Dynagro, with the Protect and the Foliar Pro. I think it's Foliar, Foliar Pro, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a noticeable improvement with the pests. Noticeable. They went from getting like what looked like they were getting decimated to then just shooting off like a rocket. And, uh, you know, maybe there's some other reason for that. Maybe it was the timing of it all. Maybe they were just finally got themselves established. Maybe they all finally, uh, you know, I, I just don't think that's the case. I, I, I really don't think the, the, the answer is anything else but the silica because with my observation is telling me is that the plants that were getting attacked were in different stages. It didn't matter what stage they were in. They all just got through this at, at like, uh, equally as well you know so if i had some plants that were way behind some others 
because I direct seeded them, let's say two weeks later, and they were the same thing. I had some pe- I had some trouble with my my peppers, my eggplants being germinated. At least I thought. So I direct seeded them twice, and the peppers that lagged behind the eggs, the eggplants that lagged behind. You would think because they're lagging behind, they're just having a lot more pest pressure because of because they're just you know more susceptible, right? They're more tender plants. They're smaller plants, uh, and they were getting a beat down. And all I did was spray them, and it was like nothing had ever happened. The pests went away. I didn't see the pests anymore. That potato beetle just gone, gone. Um, flea beetle damage almost non-existent at that point Um, the cucumber beetle haven't seen a single real attack from the cucumber beetle yet haven't seen it Um, now the borer I wonder if the the dynagro protect would actually help from the dyna from the uh, from that borer but I'd probably have to spray the the stem or continually spray the zucchini I didn't spray the zucchinis that much. Those patty pan squash, they took off. And I gave them a couple sprays, but as soon as they just took off, I was like, well, they don't need any help. They're good. Um, I'm starting to see some mildew on them. But I guess those are the plants that also had the, the borer damage. So I don't know. I don't know what exactly. I can't definitively say that this was it. But I'm confident I'm going to spray this stuff again next year, and I recommend it. I do. I recommend it with the foliar spray, the foliar, foliar pro, foliage pro, I think it's called. That's what it is. And uh, together, these two in a, in a sprayer really doesn't take a whole lot of time to use the product. It's really quick to apply it. It's easy. It's, you know, it's so simple. Rather than going around with some liquid fertilizer, even putting down organic fertilizer in the soil, I think this is even easier than that. Um, so for me, I'm I'm pretty like, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, I got it, I got it, you know, I figured it out, I got it. That epiphany moment, the aha moment, you know, um, and now I'm saying to myself, all right, well. We got this whole thing figured out. We got it. I mean, I'm thinking even the the fall garden, the summer gardens, the spring garden, all the gardens, I think, are pretty much at this point solidified. It's just a matter of mastering a couple individual crops. So now I'm thinking, all right, well, like I said, we got this together. We, we know what we're, we're doing. At least we're confident, right? Um, more confident than we were so now it's time to experiment and learn and try some other crops and see if we can find something that's going to be a new staple in my summer garden so that's what i'm thinking about in today's episode took us a while to get there but thank you guys here for joining me in this episode of fruit talk Uh, this is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. Talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables and how to use that stuff in the kitchen. I want to talk about the summer garden a little bit more and then also what we're going to potentially grow next year. What are the different crops and different varieties of these different crops? What I want to hear from you guys as well. I know I don't really ask you guys for that much in terms of your comments but i love to hear what everybody grows this is one of my really one of my favorite favorite things on the uh just having access to so many people and hearing what you guys have to say about what it is that you're doing i think is very it's just a, it's a very interesting thing to be able to you know it's almost like i have a lot of friends <laughs> Not that I don't have a lot of friends, but it's almost like, you know, having a group of uh, a lot of friends that grow food, let's say. And I'm able to then reach out to all my friends that grow food and say, hey, what are you guys doing this year? And then I get this overwhelming response. So 
Um, I think that's pretty cool. So what I'm asking you guys is I'm going to tell you what I'm growing, but I want to hear from you guys as well. And not just for some stupid algorithm's sake. I really want to know. Um, all right. So let's talk about the garden real quick of what we've done. Or at least I'm going to, maybe I'm going to skip ahead to some cucumbers. And I'm thinking, because I got a cucumber in my hand here, and I want to eat this damn thing. All right. Um, I read... Because I, I haven't been all that impressed with the cucumbers this year. Not necessarily how well they've been doing, but the varieties that I chose to grow, I have not been all that impressed. I don't know why my webcam is so bright, but this is a white cucumber. I mean, it, it's yellow, yellowish white. There you go. That's a better, better photo. It's about two and a half inches long. Um, now I've read on the internet, it says that it should be at least the best size to harvest them is when they're four inches long. And I found one today that was yellow, but almost orange. Like see this yellow color, they go from this white to starting to get some yellow at the tips here at the top. Then they get more and more yellow like to this one and then they turn almost orange which is a very strange phenomenon and it says like they say on seedsavers.org they say hey they're best eaten when four <laughs> best eaten when four inches long right um and there's always a good the best time to harvest these cucumbers i find most of them i have historically when i've grown cucumbers i've grown in the past the lemon cucumber this is why i'm bringing up this one i really was fascinated and was like really enjoying these light colored yellow white cucumbers because they're a bit citrusy they've got a little bit of something extra to them i've heard good things about this one this is one that um what's that guy his name the nomadic farmer who uh jim kovaleski that's his name he recommended this one so he's a market gardener who recommended the boothby's blonde and i have not like i said i just have not been impressed i have liked the lemon cucumber in the past um it's quite a good cucumber I just have not necessarily, it's not like I'm in love with this cucumber. Um, but it is white. It is a lighter color cucumber. And I, for that reason, I love it. Um, it has a great flavor. So I thought, well, I'm going to like this one. In fact, I originally wanted to grow the Boothby's Blonde, but I couldn't find it. So I went with the lemon. And I was happy I went with the lemon because I like it. But... I still feel like what I used to grow, I used to grow the bait alpha cucumber and I didn't never really had great success back then. But of the bait alpha cucumbers I, I got to eat in the past, they were extremely good. Um, doesn't look like it's on their website right now, but it's when you pick it, at a much smaller size because this is I would find I find this is a more mature version of the the Boothby's Blonde they're obviously more tender you know the the earlier you pick any cucumber so I want a cucumber that's tender um, I don't want something that's got a thick skin it's hard difficult to chew a poor eating experience right I want the better texture I want the cucumber with the best texture because I like to eat these cucumbers f fresh. I mean, I have pickling cucumbers I'm growing this year, which we'll throw in the in the um, the pickle jar. We have been throwing them in. I have been throwing them in the pickle jar. Um, and those need obviously different characteristics, but the these other ones here, I'm eating them fresh. So I want something with the with the best texture. I want something with the best flavor. No bitterness. Obviously, as some cucumbers can be bitter, I want something sweet. I want something interesting. 
these I find they have some kind of interesting chalkiness to them, which is good. But I want something that's really, really, really good. And I don't know what that is. And I've heard a lot of people suggest all kinds of stuff over the years. Here it is right here. Here's the bait alpha cucumber. And I went through this and it, sa it says here, a delicious, very sweet cucumber, usually pick small, does not need peeling as the skin's very tender. This is ex completely accurate. I just said this. <laughs> it says the variety is very popular in Mediterranean, having been developed in Israel at a kibbutz farm and is now becoming popular with Americans because of the fruit's fine flavor and high yields. The cuke is also burpless, has a great shelf life, shelf life parthenocarpic you can grow it in a greenhouse without pollinators so i also found that this cucumber was indeed quite productive actually there was no bitterness the flavor was great again pick it small i mean it's just a delicious cucumber i think i might just say screw it i'm gonna grow this one forget about forget about all this you know these long lists of cucumbers here, all these crazy ones. I know there's some that people go really crazy for if I can find some here. I know the Mexican sour gherkin has got some kind of following to it. The market more has a, a good following. Um, what else they got here? The Armenian yard long cucumber, people uh, are lo in love with it. And I wonder if it's because it's of the size, you know? Um, if I, This is also another one here that's very popular, the West India Burr Gherkin. But I think there's a different name for this. Um, I know someone's going to recommend the Armenian yard long, right? Light green, mild tasting. Deeply ribbed fruit, elongated fruit yields uniform, easily digestible fluted slices. They are apt to twist and coil growing on the ground, but develop nice and straight when hanging from a trellis. 24 inches long, but best harvested about 15 inches. Classic Armenian cucumber is actually a melon and not a cucumber. Yeah, I've read about this in Amy Goldman's book, so... I don't know. I know there's a big following for this, but I'll tell you that bait alpha cucumber is ridiculously good. And if someone can really definitively tell me that this is a really very good tasting cucumber and it has a superior texture, it's very tender, doesn't have a very thick skin, there's no bitterness, then I would I would consider growing one of these. And I want to hear what you guys have to say. I do. I want to hear what your what your cucumber recommendation is. So let me know down in the comments specifically about your cucumbers. What are you guys doing? Um, I'm gonna try this lemon or this Boothby's blonde cucumber right now. This is, I think, a more along the size of what they recommend, but I have a feeling this is really for slicing and not really for fresh eating. Oh. Oh. Well, it is quite good. The skin on this is very thick and it's tough. But it's not a very thick skin, you know. A lot of that is flesh. And it's actually quite good. It's got a nice chalkiness to it. There's no citrus in it. Doesn't taste like lemons, like the lemon cucumber does. No bitterness. It's good. It's just, I think this is more of a slicing cucumber with that skin. You know, 
You harvest these things at a more tender, young age, like the bait alpha, and it's almost like there's no skin. This one has got a really tough skin to it, and I'm just not, when eating fresh, I'm not going to go out of my way to eat this. I don't know. It's good, but it's 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 just lacking in some category. But it's better than like like I I was surprised because it's better than what I've had it in the past. You know, these last few weeks that I've been eating these at a much smaller size, more tender. Th this one here is better than those, surprisingly. But it's still lacking. I don't I don't know. All right, so we'll we'll think about these cucumbers. Hopefully, someone can give us some good recommendations here. Now, there is a um, a tomato that I heard about, which is called the the Principe Borghese tomato. Borghese. Principe. The principal <laughs> Borghese tomato. <laughs> Anyway, it's an Italian heirloom, and what I've heard about this, what, how I've heard about this tomato, is that it's supposed to be like the best tomato to dry, and you can just literally cut off a cluster, a truss, and they don't fall off the vine very easily, and you can just hang them up, and they'll just they'll dry, and you got a real easy way to dry tomatoes. Instead of sticking them in the dehydrator, this one's really good at just doing that. So it has a natural, a naturally very good drying capability to it. And, you know, I think that's interesting. I really do. I think that would be a wonderful, wonderful thing for so many reasons, so many purposes. And they also say it makes great sauce, which is interesting. I would be... I would love to try this thing. I'm surprised that a cherry tomato is so great for sauce. That surprises me. Um, yeah, I mean, I've tried a lot of different cherry tomatoes too. And for me to think about trying another one is kind of crazy. But, you know, I, I really do. There's a lot of reputation behind this. It says here, at least this person commented, Well, maybe it's not this person. I don't know. Oh, here we go. If you like dried tomatoes, whether you sun dry or oven dry or dehydrate, there is simply no tomato in existence that can compare to the principal Borghese tomato. So, you know, I don't know if this person really knows what they're talking about, Elsa, but, you know, that's a really good sign. Here we go. Here's another person. These are the best tomato for drying I have found. This person slices them in half and dehydrates them. But dried, they're wonderful. Fresh, they're just okay. Perfect Italian cooking tomatoes. Classic taste right from the pan. And people obviously have been commenting on how abundant they are, you know. So, interesting. I think we're going to try these. <laughs> this person's really excited. <laughs> I want to read this review. It says, this was my first ever tomato garden, so I had no expectations. I chose this tomato as I was interested in making sauces, salsas, topping pizzas, and add, adding them to salads. To say I was not disappointed is a huge understatement. I grow in self-watering containers as our soil is terrible, and I literally <laughs> had tomato plants over seven feet tall and covered with tomatoes. It was almost... A full-time job keeping up with picking, washing, freezing, and vacuum sealing them daily. Wow. Maybe this was beginner's luck. 
but I surely am grateful. The taste was was lovely, and they exceeded my hopes. I will grow these every year for sure. Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Four question marks. I don't know if we needed the four question marks, but yeah, I think I want to grow them. I mean, it's not often, as I say, that I want to try a new tomato variety. So there's some value here. And I, that's kind of what at this point I'm looking for. And I know a lot of you guys, you pro- a lot of you guys, I imagine, have actually been growing vegetables for a long time. I Probably, I would say more than half of you guys have been growing vegetables, maybe longer than I have. Um, so at least the way I see it, maybe you guys see it the same way, is that when you're going to grow something new, it should fulfill some sort of purpose. What is this purpose? Well, I want to grow this particular tomato because I think it's going to really do well in the kitchen. It's going to have a different type of tomato that I'm not used to. Tomatoes I use, I have cherry tomatoes. I eat them fresh. I snack on them throughout the day. The best one for my money is the black cherry. Second would probably be sun gold. Then we move on to another category, the slicing tomato. These are for sandwiches. I even eat these fresh out of hand, a little bit of salt on them. For my money, the pink brandy wine wins that category. There's also another cherry tomato. There's also another tomato, which is sort of more of a salad type, which is more of the midsize, maybe something a little bit larger than a cherry. And those you could use in salads. You could also eat them fresh. You could cook with them. I find that those I cook with more than any other. They're a good size to slice them in half, put them in the pan uh, with the slice side down, and they cook really well. They add nice flavor to whatever it is you're eating. Um, For my money, the green zebra so far is the best one that I'm growing. I have a couple other other tomatoes we're trying, like the, the garden peach. I'm interested to see how that one does. But again, uh, the green zebra has a nice home. It fulfills a nice little gap here because what it does is that it actually um, is a green tomato, and it's very acidic, and it's just very interesting because it has low sweetness and very high acidity. And that creates to me an interesting something different that is really worth growing for for many reasons. So for me, I think that's a legitimate thing to grow. And therefore, I, uh, I've, I've always, for me, I always wanna grow this tomato. I did like the Black Beauty tomato last year. It wasn't all that productive, but it did have great flavor. It was like a tomato was combined with fennel. And I thought, you know, I could always just get some fennel and throw it on the tomato and eat it. You know, you could always get some basil, fennel, oregano. You got all these herbs handy at this time of year. Um, Why not just throw it with a tomato? Now this garden peach, I, I am quite excited about, and I will get to try that this year. I'm, I'm 99% sure. Um, I think what we're gonna do here is we're gonna add this this stuff to my cart. So I, before I forget, you guys think this is all for you, but you know I, I don't want to. <laughs> I want to order this stuff so I have it in the future. Um, let's talk beans because my beans this year, ah, I wish I had brought the beans upstairs. By the way, this is the green zebra tomato. Look at this beauty. Look how vibrant and colorful this damn thing is. It's insane. And again, they're insanely good. It's green, not on the skin, but also on the inside. Very acidic, next level tomato. Let me just take a bite. Oh yeah. Now it's a damn shame 
the texture isn't a little bit better on this tomato. It could be, if it was meatier and not as grainy, I would say this is the best tomato I have. Because the flavor is out of this world. The acidity in this thing is ridiculous. And it's nice because you do get a lot of juice. There's a lot of juice. And that juice is what really gives you all that acidity, all that amazing flavor. The flesh is kind of just meh. If there was a better fleshed green zebra, and believe it or not, what the heck's that guy's name? I know his name's Brad Gates, but what the what's the name of his Black Beauty Tomato? What is the name of his company? His farm. I think he has what I'm trying to get at here is I think he actually has an improved green zebra tomato. If the internet will cooperate, we might <laughs> we might be able to get to the bottom of this. Let's skip ahead real quick. So the beans, as I've said, I didn't I don't have the beans that I grew this year up with me. I grew uh I think it's called the Island Creek Annie. That one is for shelling. I realize you really need to have a lot of room if you're gonna be doing shelling beans. They also were not really that productive. Quite disappointing, the Island Creek Annie. Um, also, I did the Hadassah Shield beans up the corn. I mentioned that we planted them too late. I don't know how productive they're gonna be. I don't know how productive they would be. I like the idea of shelling beans. I want to have shelling beans in the future. What we did do was grow the Chinese noodle bean, or we didn't grow it. We wanted to grow it. I think they're called the yard long bean. No, they're the red Chinese noodle bean. And this is the one that I thought was going to be best tasting, very interesting. I didn't have anything necessarily to grow it on. And maybe I could have grown these on top of the corn rather than the Hidatsa shield beans. But this is what I went with. I decided to go with the, the shield beans because I thought, you know, it's a three sisters garden. Probably should do it right. But anyway, these um, I think might be one of the best beans for sauteing, right? Um, I don't think you necessarily have to saute the Kalima bean all that much, which is the bean, the fr type of French bean that I really like. Oh, I'd love to grow some fava beans too. We're going to plant some fava beans in the spring. Now, the French bean, which is more, you know, like the string bean, that's the bean that I like eating the most. And I've haven't grown many varieties of them. I know people love the Blue Lake bush bean. I've grown the Kalima bean and it's been very, very, very tasty for years. I love this thing. Um, you don't have to cook them that long. Really, you can I eat them raw. I snack on them all the time. Um, maybe there's something better out there in that category. Maybe the Blue Lake bush bean is, is better. Um, I don't know. Uh, but I'll tell you one new one that we grew this year was the dragon tongue bean. And this is legitimately very good. When you put this in the oven, put some olive oil on it, some salt, they're really, really good. Um, they have a really nice nutty flavor to them. Doesn't really taste much like a French bean. I'll tell you that. Um, very different. So it's worth growing both types, the French beans and this one here. Um, I'm a big fan, huge fan of this bean. So I think I'll grow these again. For sure. I want to grow some, 
you know, I want to grow some of those, uh, the French beans. This Chinese red noodle bean, again, seems also very interesting as well. I don't know. I think I need to figure out a couple little holes, right? I need to find a good shelling bean. Um, I need to f and figure out, you know, if I want to grow indeed this Chinese red noodle bean, maybe I can find something better in the form of the blue lake bush bean. Um, who knows? What are you guys doing for beans? Now, let's continue on real quick with the eggplant here. This was the first year I decided to try a different type of eggplant. Um, we grew the ping tong. And this ping tong, oh wow, I didn't know it can get that long. Maybe I should leave them on there. But I like these Asian style eggplants. You know, I went with the ping tong because it's more of an early eggplant. It seems to be better suited maybe for this climate. Um, they seem to do pretty well. I don't think they're nearly as productive maybe. Um, it might just be the fact that mine are a bit shaded because of how dense it is back there. And I also have like two or three eggplants in one hole. You know, I didn't thin out some of these eggplants <laughs> um, like I probably should have, but it's amazing, I think, um, how good this eggplant is. It really underestimated because what you can do with them, they're, you know, long and slender, unlike, you know, the more traditional Italian type eggplant. Those are better for soaking up flavors. Right, getting sauce and oil and you know spices and different things. These ping tong eggplants are great for sautéing or for roasting them in the oven. What I do is I make the best eggplant fries. It's my new thing. They're incredible. They're so good. You know the ones that are big and fat, the Italian style. You can normally I've cut those up, sliced them up in circles, in rings, and then thrown those rings in the uh, in the oven, and they're just not. They don't got it. Those rings just pale in comparison to this ping tong eggplant, and I don't know if it's just the shape. I'll tell you that it's because there's the right amount of flesh and there's a lot of skin. And that skin gets real nice and crispy. The flesh remains quite moist, soaks up flavor, just enough flavor, but it's it's like the perfect texture, perfect flavor. Maybe these other ones would do just as well, you know, of a similar shape like this one here or the fairy tale eggplant. I know I've grown that one in the past or tried to grow that one. Maybe this one would do as well. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to mess with it, you know. I don't want to mess with what I got, but I'll tell you they are uh, a high recommendation for me. So that's more not necessarily asking for you guys. I just wanted to point out those eggplants. This is another one here I figured out, or at least realized um, I should grow which is the tomatillo and this year I'm gonna really try to do myself a favor and make some salsa um, I don't I'm waiting for my my uh, peppers to come in uh, they're turning red as we speak but they're taking their time as peppers too um, I don't have any hot peppers, but that's okay because I have a lot of hot sauce and I'm not really worried about that. So this tomatillo though um, would be nice in, a, in a, uh, a salsa. And it's not necessary. My friend Danny told me he makes a great salsa so I got a recipe from him. And he's like, he didn't even actually include tomatillo in his recipe. 
So, which I, I found a bit interesting. I don't know why. I've never grown tomatillos. I really have not eaten them that much either. What I'm going to do um, is I am going to buy some tomatillos at the store. Um, anything else I need for the salsa, I'll get it at that time. Make the salsa. See what I like. If I like the tomatillos with it, without it what the deal is with the salsa, get better at it, make some sort of judgment call as to whether or not I should grow tomatillos next year. However, I found out that the tomatillo, this particular one, Queen of Malinalco, is extremely tasty in that you can eat it fresh. So you eat it like a snack. You don't even need to cook it like most tomatillos. So it says here, the fruit is used to make salsas. It can also be cooked up like tomatoes or simply eating, eaten fresh. So I thought that was really interesting that you can eat this thing fresh and it's actually quite good. I didn't know, at least maybe there is other tomatillos that you can eat fresh. And for that, I think there's some value in this. So even maybe if I don't, want the tomatillos in my salsa I can grow this one and taste some fresh maybe at some point I would want them in my salsa or some sort of cooking I don't know but this one it seems to be at least quite interesting now the last thing I want to talk about and I'm curious about is summer squash and winter squash and the the winter squash we've talked a lot about in other episodes of Fruit Talk. I've had whole episodes just dedicated to squash. There's many types of winter squash. And uh, I'll tell you, my favorite is the kabocha squash. And I got to try that at uh, a restaurant here in Philadelphia. I've also grown some pumpkins in the past. We made some pumpkin pie. And, you know, it's sad when you learn that pumpkin pies that you buy at the store are filled with not pumpkin, but sweet potato filling. Um, I like pumpkin seeds, you know, roasted seeds. We were going to try at one point, you know, growing some um, acorn squash. I narrowed it down, however, to, cause there's delicata. I was going to narrow it down to delicatas. I narrowed it down to The spaghetti squash, that was another one. The kabocha squash. And the butternut. And the butternut I've always had good success with. And um, it's a good one to grow. It's very tasty. So for me, I, uh, I like the butternuts, but you can get them at the store. And this is where I really struggle with growing any winter squash, is that it takes up a lot of room. They're huge plants. They're extremely cheap. So for me to grow one of these, it's just, it's very iffy. I can even buy the kabocha squash at the store any time of the year. Um, so for me, I don't think I need to grow winter squash, but I'm thinking to myself, wow, my cucumbers were a success. My melons were a success. My squash was a success. Maybe I'm pushing my luck, but <laughs> maybe next year I can find a spot for some uh, some winter squash. I don't know. But anyway, long story short, that's one that I would like to see if I could uh, get back into and try that one. But there's also the summer squash, and I thought this would be rather interesting. Um because what I had tried to do, instead of growing these yellow or green zucchini here, um, I decided instead to grow myself some patty pan squash, some scallop squash. Again, it's done great, but I've since realized, and other people have mentioned to me on uh, one of my videos, um, in fact, one of my longer time fans had mentioned to me um, 
that I should try to grow cue ball squash. I think it's a cue ball. I don't remember exactly what the name of this thing is, but I'm sure I'm going to find it right here as we go through this. But there's other types of squash, and I thought, well, I like the patty pan for stuffing, so let's try that. I did it, I stuffed it, came out wonderful. They're incredible. Maybe I can find one that's better than what I've got. I don't know. Um, I think it has very thick walls to it, and I wish it didn't. So maybe there's one of these squash here that uh, will not be as thick. I think we can improve upon what we've done. But what about some other types of zucchini here? This is an interesting looking squash. And this pineapple squash is interesting. I'm going to have to look into all these different scallop squashes here. There's also the uh, people have like <laughs> really wanted me. Look at all these scallop squashes. Holy crap. These are interesting. Uh, the, I probably grew, honestly, one of the worst scallop squashes now that I think about it. I probably could have gotten, here we go. This looks like the type of squash I was told to grow. lemon squash but anyway they were telling me that this different cue ball squash these round type are great for stuffing just like the patty pan but better this one here desi summer squash produces loads of round baseball sized fruit that's great to use as you would use any zucchini hmm I don't know about that one pineapple squash Incredible Stuff Squash, Burby's Catalog, Most Fine-Grained Squashes Around. What does that mean exactly? What's a fine-grained squash? It is an interesting-looking variety. I'll tell you that. Uh, I don't know how you would stuff this thing very well because these little ridges on them would make it really quite difficult I imagine here's a zucchino rapicante squash which is uh, looks like kakuza to me but kakuza really is one as I said that a lot of people have been asking me to grow and it's a vining squash, and you should grow it vertically. Maybe that's what this is. Gagoots. Maybe that's what this type of squash here is for. I don't know. It says Italians use it for stuffing doki and ravioli. This person says here, Bethany said, I'll never grow yellow summer squash again. This replaces it when picked young and goes on to replace butternut squash when you miss some and they mature into three inch long monsters of solid flesh that keeps until the next spring. Tastes way better than zucchini or yellow squares, has much better meat to seed ratio than other winter squashes. And then look at this photo. Oh my god, that looks good. I don't really know what that is, but it looks like some kind of zucchini latka or something. Wow. Interesting. White scallop squash, Native American heirloom. Best tasting, highest yielding varieties. 
fried or baked. Passion stripe melange squash. French scallop. That's quite interesting. It's got warts, stripes. Is it more for that or for cooking? I, I don't know. Ronde or Ronde de Nice Denise squash. French heirloom. Fresh the flesh is ra of this round green zucchini is very fine, very tender and fine flavored, making it ideal squash for stuffing. Ooh. This is it. This is the one that we gotta try. Uh, we also gotta try this gagoots here. I think this is what that is. If that's what gagoots does. Um, that's insane. If all Gagoots or Kakuza does that, whew. The lemon squash. Nah. Well. Interesting. So, I think that's what we're going to do here, guys. We are going to probably grow this Ronda Knight Denise and the uh, Kakuza next year. Maybe I can find a slightly better patty pan, but I imagine that this Ronda Nice is going to be the king because if you says here, very tender and fine flavored. Um, I think this is probably better for stuffing. The scallops make it annoying. And the walls of the scallop is very thick. I just want the zucchini to house whatever is inside. The inside goodness of the, the stuffing is the best part. And then you got the mild pepper or the mild zucchini on the outside. And to me, that is good. But it shouldn't be the king of the playground, right? We need to have the stuffing getting the attention and a thinner wall of the zucchini. So I hope that's what this will happen with this Ronde Danis. And of course, there's the blue lake here we have to read into. It says here, it is the standard. And it's been the standard, it says here, for 40 years. Set heavy yields of flavorful pods, tender and crisp. Well, maybe this one will beat the Kalima bean. I think we got to try it, right? Probably should have the Kalima bean side by side, should we not? We are going to bookmark some of this stuff, I think, because <laughs> I can't add all this to my cart. And then, of course, I think in the spring, we're going to try the fava bean for the first time um, in years. And I think I just need to get the fava beans out there, start them indoors, and plant them literally as early as humanly possible, and I'll get myself a successful crop to some degree. I want to dry them and have these fava beans dried, roasted, and seasoned all right guys thank you so much here for tuning in for this episode of fruit talk this is a longer one than i had expected hope you guys made it this long if you enjoyed this one let me know give us a rating on itunes leave us a comment on youtube um we'll see you guys next week consider consider supporting us on patreon guys if you really enjoy the podcast and thank everybody again for tuning in. We'll see you guys soon, all right? Stay safe out there.